Well, now it is time for us to uh, take our Bibles once again and uh, dig in together a little bit. So I would encourage you to turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 9, and uh, we'll spend a little more time in that passage uh, that was read earlier. I have, uh, I have two goals for us this morning as we get into this little time. Uh, number one goal would be that we are kind of encouraged in the gospel itself, that we are kind of reminded and refreshed about uh, certain aspects of the gospel and how important they are for us. So that would be one goal. So uh, I, I hope you're here, you know, uh, with some some goals in mind, that you're not just here to put in the time until we uh, move on to the rest of our day, that there that there can be some goals for us in these next uh, 20 or 30 minutes together. So first one that we understand uh, and just are reminded of the gospel and encouraged in that. And then second of all, that, that we would be challenged to keep following Jesus even when it's hard. We're going to be learning about some individuals that really were very blessed by uh, what the Lord did for them. and. Um, Sometimes we might feel like, well, uh, we just follow God and everything is perfect and, and all of our problems are gone and there's no issues. But the, the fuller picture of the gospel is that it often involves some hard things as well. And um, my question for us today would be, are we willing to follow Jesus in the, in the good times? Yes, but in the hard times as well. Are we able and willing to do that? So that would be a second goal, just to kind of get us to think about that and examine that a little bit. All right, so uh, let's just uh, take a moment and pray, and then we will go from there. Heavenly Father, as we're gathered this morning, uh, we thank you that your word speaks to our hearts, that we are able to learn from you, uh, rely upon you. Uh, we have great need of you, as we've been singing about and talking about already. So help us, Lord, to depend upon you now in these moments in order that we might learn and apply the truth of your work. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's. Uh, the, the title here, Have Mercy on Us, from Matthew 9, um, and a key verse would be, when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And, and just thinking about things from that perspective, okay? Um, let's uh, look at this little picture that I've got here of uh, some car parts. Uh, um, for some of you, this might just look a little bit... Uh, uh, overwhelming as you think, how on earth do we get all of those parts put together? How, how is it possible? And, and I would say that is a tricksy, tricksy thing. However, um, I want to, okay, yeah, I couldn't make this work a second ago, but here we go. Let's uh, scroll. I can't seem to control it. There we go. All right, let's let's pretend that this uh, can be bought at IKEA. Did you know this is a joke that you can buy a car from IKEA, and that's the only tool you need to put it together. Um, any of you who have uh, purchased anything at IKEA will recognize that little tool as uh, the the little. Uh, Allen wrench that seems to work magic for us. So as we think about the parts of the gospel, uh, why am I having trouble here? Okay, here we go. I don't want to give you, I don't want to give you everything at once. But let's talk about putting the gospel together. Instead of putting the car together, uh, which uh, I wouldn't do very well at, but I'd, I'd certainly have fun trying. Uh, I'd, I'd probably put every part on backwards first and then put it on the right way after three times of trying. Uh, but let's talk about putting the gospel together. 
what Jesus is doing in, in Matthew here and what we're learning about as we go through Matthew is that he is uh, explaining what the gospel is, but, but he's doing it in many different ways at many different times with many different conversations with many different people. And uh, he, he uses words, he uses actions. Um, and soon he's going to use his very own life uh, as he goes to the cross. But uh, what we have here is, is uh, a sense of, of him leading up to that. He is teaching the people by uh, uh, wonderful words. Just back in Matthew 5 through 7, we have that Sermon on the Mount and all of those um, great words that Jesus spoke there to kind of tell uh, what this life of following Jesus would look like. And then we're seeing, uh, have you noticed that in these kind of next few chapters here uh, through the Gospel of Matthew, there's an awful lot of miracles that are happening. A lot of people getting healed um, and Jesus directly, uh, whether feeding people or, or healing people, there, there are a lot of miracles where Jesus is acting out the Gospel. He's living it out in a particular way. Now, in these passages, we do not yet uh, have him specifically speaking about dying on the cross. We know that that, you know, if we ask ourselves, okay, what is the central part of the gospel story? We would certainly go to the cross and, and rightly so. But what Jesus is doing is leading them in that direction. He's not there yet. That does come. For example, um, we won't turn there right now, but if we were to hop over to Matthew 16, verse 21 says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So that's in chapter 16, where he begins to share the actual specifics of the crucifixion there. Um, with the disciples, and there are multiple times that Jesus does that, and they don't really fully understand that uh, until later, until after the cross. But what we have in, in what we're looking at uh, today is the various elements of the gospel or parts of the gospel that we can begin to put together. We have the advantage of knowing that the cross is, is the ultimate uh, part of this, but we can see uh, various things leading up to it, and so that's what I would like us to examine here. We're gonna we're gonna look at a few pieces, not uh, of a car, but of the gospel. So if we were to go to that first one, which says we are broken by sin, the first point this morning, as we just think about uh, aspects to the gospel would be the understanding that we are broken by sin. If you were to um, go with me to just a few of these verses, for, for example, verse 18 in our passage, so Matthew 9 and verse 18, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died. And just going that far, we one of the ways that we see the effects of sin is through death, the death of this particular girl. Uh, the other stories that come after, the events that come after, speak about different things. For example, a woman who had uh, this issue of blood, uh, that, that she had been bleeding for, for 12 years, and um, they weren't able to, to stop that. And, and so... Uh, she was suffering greatly for a long period of time. Uh, a couple others uh, that are spoken of in these verses, it talks about uh, two blind guys. If we were to look at, at verse 27, as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. It's, it's this awareness that they are broken, that they uh, are um, truly under the effects of, of sin. If we go to the next uh, event that's spoken of, it talks about someone who is demon oppressed as well, who has a demon and Jesus uh, takes care of that and casts that demon out. 
So we've got a lot of situations where um, we see the brokenness that is, is caused by sin. Now, immediately what, what comes to our mind is, okay, if I have a physical problem, then is it because of a particular sin that I have committed or something of that nature? And, and that's, that's a valid question to ask. And so we just need to clearly state that um, not all of our problems or our, um, the issues or things that we deal with are a direct result of a specific sin that you or I have committed. That's, that's not the way that uh, works. But we can say that all problems, all uh, aspects of brokenness in our world are the result of living in a world that is broken by sin. And so it may or may not be something that you and I have done directly. We are sinful creatures by our very nature. And so we do sin. But then there are things that are done to us by others. And there are effects that are around in our world today. And we're all suffering from that. And so uh, these individuals are just examples of some of the ways that God's cre creation is broken because of sin. You and I have, uh, we could tell our own story uh, of, of our brokenness. And for some of us, that would, uh, we would think of specific events where we have been greatly affected because of the brokenness that we have faced uh, by our own actions or someone else. Uh, we are, are broken by sin. And that certainly is one aspect of the gospel that it is good for us to be reminded of here. Secondly, you'll see on the screen, we have an inability to fix ourselves. That's the other thing that becomes clear in each of these situations. They're, it's beyond their own ability to change this thing. And obviously, probably the greatest example here would be the death one, where uh, this girl has, has already died and, and uh, it's over, it's done. Uh, the the professional funeral mourners are gathered and everything is taking place and it's it's already happened in that sense. Um, the individuals who are blind, uh, they the, unable to help themselves. The the woman with the issue of blood, uh, I'm sure she had looked for many solutions over the course of that 12 years and. No help seemed to be available. And you and I have this inability to fix ourselves. We, because of sin, because sin is our greatest uh, issue, we are not able to remove that aspect on our own. And, and so there is this uh, helplessness that is experienced here by these various individuals. There, there seems to be, uh, unless Jesus can do something, it's game over. Um, there, it's the end of the road for them, and there, there is very much a, uh, there's no other place for them to turn, and, and so it is uh, a good place for us to be when we can acknowledge that uh, as sinners, we are unable to fix our own problems. There might be many things that we try and fix in our own lives, and we take control over this or that or the other, but we are not able to fix our sin problem. And you may have experienced a sense of hopelessness. You've tried hard to fix maybe some relational difficulty or some other uh, problem that you have had. And, and we come to the end of our rope and we acknowledge, I can't do it. Well, that, that is a part of the gospel as well. We, we cannot save ourselves. We, we cannot make ourselves good enough, righteous enough, um, whole enough. We, we just are not able to do that. And so we uh, need to look beyond ourselves for the help that is needed. So in this, in this gospel story, then, the third point was that we see individuals who are demonstrating faith and belief and trust in Jesus. And, and that becomes a, a clear part of these events as well. Uh, there is a, a real uh, 
a demonstration of, of people's of people placing their trust in the Lord. Look again at some of the same verses, but verse 18, um, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So there, there is a clear sense that we can't do anything about this, but you could, Jesus, you could do this, uh, take care of this. Uh, verse 21, um, can't find it. Here we are. For she said to herself, uh, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. So this is the woman, and she is acknowledging that Jesus is able to do something here. And so there is a trust and a belief in him. And if we were to go to verses 27 and 28, as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. There is this um, real sense in which the individuals uh, are clear that they, they believe that Jesus can do something about their situation. Now, what are they basing that on? Uh, they could be basing that on what they have seen him do in other situations. And as we said, there's been a lot of uh, examples in their uh, recent past where Jesus was healing people and he was getting a name for himself for doing that. And, um, and so some would have just felt may maybe they had seen him heal someone else. They felt that he could do the same for them. There were others that uh, truly acknowledged him even at this early stage as the one sent from God to be the Messiah. And, and so they would be uh, acknowledging that God was at work here and it was God who, would, who was able. So their, their faith was not simply in this person named Jesus. For some of them, they recognized him as the son of God. And so there was this incredible faith there. Uh, we have others who, who uh, it, it's hard to know of their immediate circumstances and what they were operating, what kind of knowledge they were operating out of. But there was a sense in which they were trusting in the Lord, trusting in him. Um, I just love that phrase where the uh, the two blind guys say, they, they call out to Jesus, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. We are lost. We are hopeless. We are helpless. We need your mercy. And, and so they're just pleading with him. Isn't that a picture of how you and I ought to be in in coming to the Lord, just realizing that we are so broken and so lost. That sheep without a shepherd. We'll, we'll talk about that next week, too. And, and a good, good example there, how we are in need, great need of the Lord to fix us, to help us, to redeem us. And um, I just uh, appreciate the humility that is expressed in those words. Have mercy on us. It's, uh, it's quite a picture. So these individuals demonstrate faith, belief, trust in the Lord um, by, by their response. And then as we go down just a little bit further, what we see is that Jesus gives life, cleansing, wholeness. Uh, Jesus is a miracle worker. Um, there is no question about that, but he is pointing to the greater truth that he is not only able to um, heal individuals physically, but he's able to heal spiritually. That That is the message that, that he goes to. Um, just go back earlier in chapter 9 for a second um, and uh, notice... Uh, I'm going to pick it up at, at verse four, and, and this is where Jesus heals another individual. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? 
but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. And so Jesus is concerned about people's physical state and, and he does bring physical healing and wholeness here in this example. But he is also teaching a greater truth that he has the ability to forgive sin. And so always remember that, that when we see these uh, tremendous miracles in Scripture, uh, Jesus is teaching a greater lesson as well. Uh, he's pointing to something greater. And so part of that greater truth is that Jesus is the one who brings life where there is death. He's the one who cleanses us uh, when we are filthy in our own sinful rags, righteousness because of our sin. Um, he's the one who cleanses us. He's the one who makes us whole and useful for his purposes. And so in all of these examples in scripture here, we, we do have Jesus then um, bringing life and bringing uh, wholeness and the cleansing that is needed. I know we're looking at the same verses here, but notice what, what Jesus does to, with these blind individuals. Um, verse 28, he entered the house, the blind man came to him, and, and Jesus said to him, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. And so he... He did that for them. He did that. But then he says something uh, interesting there in verse 30 as well. See that no one knows about it. See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. Now, it would seem to me, uh, just at a casual reading of things and what I would seem to know, that this was pretty good news that had happened for these individuals. Um, they had been healed of, of this blindness. Uh, things were much different for them now. And, uh, and, and you would think they would, they would want to tell that, and you can understand that. Jesus says, no, don't tell anyone. And he says it quite sternly. Uh, it's a fairly strong word that is used there. Uh, they kind of ignore that instruction and go ahead anyway and tell um, lots of people. They went away, spread his fame throughout all that district. But uh, why is it that he's telling them not to, to spread it abroad? Well, um, I think the greatest part here is, uh, the greatest part of this is the fact that they only had part of the gospel message. And this is kind of what we alluded to earlier. This is not the entire message. This is an important part of it. There is uh, another important part coming later on, speaking about uh, death of Christ and, and resurrection. But if they go and spread this message around, they've only got part of the message. And what part do they have? Well, come to Jesus and he'll fix any problem you have. Look at us. He fixed our, you know, we couldn't see. Now we can see. Uh, there were some other people that had problems, Jesus took care of that too. So if you come to Jesus, he, he solves every problem you have. Now that's part of the story, but it's not the entire part. Because there are many places where we begin to see, and this especially as, as we get closer to the cross, the words of Jesus uh, as he speaks to us about coming the, the coming suffering as he speaks about the hardships that people would go through. And, and you don't have to go very far. You know, we're in chapter 9, and, and just into chapter 10, we see Jesus sending out these disciples uh, to, to go, and it says proclaim the, uh, the kingdom of heaven. And so they have a message that they are taking out to the Jewish people. And, and as part of that, Jesus says, you know, Persecution is going to come. 
and there, there's going to beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogue. So uh, you have part of the gospel story when we speak about the wholeness that Jesus brings, and he ultimately does that through his death, burial, and resurrection. But we also understand that to follow Jesus quite often will mean hardship and difficulty and trial and struggle and opposition and persecution and some of those other hard words that, that we'd rather not talk about. But they proclaim um, the part of the message that they have experienced, but it is not the whole message. And so Jesus wants them to wait because it's just not quite yet time. Uh, soon it will be time, but it is not quite time. And, and so that is a part of that. And so, um, which leads us then to our last point here, which is uh, not all believe. Uh, clearly, this good news of the gospel uh, is, is for those who will place their faith and trust in Christ, but there are those who will not do that. And so in verse 34, right after Jesus has done uh, this particular miracle of uh, casting out the demon, then we have the Pharisees who say, in verse 34, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. In other words, they do not see him as sent from God at all. They see him as an agent of Satan, and uh, they see him not as operating as, as God's Messiah. Um, they see him operating with the power of Satan. And so they choose not to believe, not to accept. And there are many other examples that we could go to as well. But not everyone is, uh, is quick to place their faith and trust in the Lord. And so that is something that we observe in our world today as well. There are those who would be quick to place their trust in Christ. And um, many of you are sitting here are examples of that very thing. But there are others who choose not to accept that. And uh, instead, they become harder. The same truth that can lead some to Christ can also make others harder against Christ. And that is also the reality of the gospel. Uh, all who will receive um, have this, this blessed privilege of knowing Christ, but not all will receive. And so there is a judgment to be faced in that regard. And so as we kind of pull this together uh, this morning, I think that there are two key parts that we want to recognize. Number one, that God does bring life, cleansing, wholeness, healing, restoration, forgiveness. God makes us new as we come to him. But secondly, Will you follow Jesus even if it becomes hard? Are you only following Jesus because he seems to have given you pretty much everything you've wanted in life up until this point? And then if your world were to kind of come crashing down tomorrow, I certainly am not wishing that upon anyone. But if things were to drastically change, would you still follow Jesus? Or would you be a fair-weather Christian who simply follows when things are good and then blames God as soon as something difficult comes into their life. Because the entire picture is going to include both aspects to that. And, and really, this is kind of preparing the way a little bit for some of the future times that we will have in, in the book of Matthew as things do begin to get difficult later on. Will you follow Jesus? not just in the good times, but in the hard times. Uh, a question for us to ponder as we gather today. And so as we just uh, close this particular portion off, and I will end sharing my screen. As we just close uh, this particular portion off, a reminder for us to, to immerse ourselves in this good news of the gospel. And to accept all aspects of it. And I'm so thankful for what Jesus said and what Jesus did. 
and we observe uh, some wonderful things here in our time together today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and how you use it in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, thank you for the incredible miracles that we observe through the word. Lord, thank you that you are a miracle working God. You are one who takes situations that appear to be very bleak, very difficult, and we can see uh, your hand very clearly at work. And Lord, um, thank you for those wonderful things that you have done and are doing. But I pray even beyond that, that we would be a people who follow you, not just in those good times and easy times and when things seem to go our way, but may we be willing also to suffer and to face hard things that may come. And so we ask for your strength and we thank you that uh, the... Uh, gospel of Jesus Christ is sufficient for us, and it is all that we have need of, and thank you for providing it for us. And so we trust in you today. In Jesus' name, amen.